So just a little bit of housekeeping, and I can see that it's already been put onto the chat, the basic Zoom housekeeping. So we are recording the session, just to let everyone know. Usual Zoom etiquette, we have um, uh, muted everyone, just so that background noise is not a problem. So if you want to um, speak when invited, then please do unmute yourself. Um, what else? Um, we'll be breaking into breakout rooms um, fairly shortly, so follow the links and hopefully all of that will work out so that people can have more opportunity to speak and get to know each other. And in the meantime, um, Amina is uh, going to let us know what the session is about today. But whilst we're doing that, many of you have already put into the chat um, who you are and what organization you are from. But we'd also love you to add one extra thing as a sort of icebreaker, which is your teaching or educator superpower. <laughs> Just to see what superpowers we have on the chat. So my one, I'm going to say, maybe mine's an aspirational superpower. My one is about uh, making the space. I know so many fantastic educators and I hope that my superpower is making the space that those people can do their magic for as many children and students and uh, yeah, allow them to thrive. So I hope that is that. And I've just seen somebody's is empathy, which is an awesome one. So let's go along with that line. And now I'm going to hand over to Amina, who's from the WISE team, who's going to just give us an overview of why this session and what our hope is from the session. So Amina, over to you. Perfect, thank you so much Rebecca for the introduction and welcome everyone. It's, uh, it's amazing to see all of you joining us, people from uh, different parts of the world. Um, so uh, I'll walk you quickly on why we're doing this uh, with uh, UWC. Um, as um, a famous a Victorian era critic said, quality is never an accident, it's always the result of intelligence, uh, intelligent effort. And I think, you know, this quote for me is really inspirational in the sense and basically talks about the core of the session. Uh, we, there are different calls for producing quality education, but are we really putting in the work to discuss uh, what uh, are the metrics uh, that we can use in terms of assessing quality for education? Um, what we measure says a lot about what we value and I think the purpose of the session for us is to uh, come together as uh, different experts, the facilitators and our great audience and participants here to talk together and explore um, what matters for us uh, when we value, uh, sorry, when we evaluate uh, quality for education. So that's basically uh, the outcome that we are trying to seek today. And uh, for us at WISE, uh, quality, um, innovation for quality uh, and access to education is really one of our um, driving, uh, let's say, spirit uh, since our inception uh, 10 years ago. And it continued to be one of our major thematic areas alongside with other areas that uh, we um, are uh, focused on, and that's education leadership, education technology, uh, behavior and learning sciences, and learning ecosystems. Um, so, uh, as most of you know, we are based at Qatar, uh, and we are uh, an umbrella. Uh, we are under the umbrella of Qatar Foundation. Uh, we're trying to help build the future of education by inspiring global movement that generates and empowers. Um, people like yourselves uh, to transform education and learning. Uh, of course, you know, the team will be posting um, our uh, website uh, for, uh, uh, for those who want to learn more about us. Uh, but that's a little bit about WISE. And as I'll give the floor to Rebecca to say a little bit about uh, UWC, and then I'm going to walk you through the rest of our components uh, for today. Perfect, thank you. So uh, UWC is um, a set of uh, 18 international schools and colleges as well as short courses and national committees. Um, and it was set up in the 60s by Kurt Hahn, who many people will know as an educationist, who believed that um, how can we bring people together for peace and a sustainable future? And he believed that if people didn't know the, each other, then um, how could they kind of learn to understand each other and then perhaps know that despite their differences, they could still go together and make a difference in the world. So the 18 schools and colleges bring together mostly people from between 16 and 18, although there are schools which are sort of the whole K to 12 spectrum, um, to really live and work together um, and, and 
yeah, share those experiences, service learning and um, yeah, education for peace is at the heart of what we do. And we were one of the original founders of the International Baccalaureate way back when, together with Ecolint and the United Nations School in New York. Um, and I think it's our fault that there are so many CAS components <laughs> with uh, the service learning being so embedded in what we do. Um, so there are 18 schools and colleges all around the world. And I know we've got many people who either work or have um, graduated from that um, uh, together with us on the course. So Amina, back to you. Thanks, Rebecca. So again, uh, as you know, we have one hour and we are already at uh, 4.08, um, at least here in Doha. Uh, so we're eight minutes past the hour. Uh, so uh, I think next what we are going to do, uh, we have uh, our speakers and facilitators today, whom Rebecca is going to introduce in a second. Each one of them uh, is going to walk us for around uh, five minutes around the topic that they're going to lead. So first, we're going to talk about how to meet the needs of uh, the 21st century, and then another five minutes on learning communities, followed by another five minutes on exploring why we're having this conversation and why we should do this. Um, and then Rebecca will walk you through our 30-minute uh, breakout sessions. After that, we're going to come back together and debrief. Uh, and we're going to use the last um, 13 minutes uh, to talk about uh, main debrief points and takeaways and next steps. Uh, so to you, Rebecca. Okay, so um, Jaya, I'm going to hand pretty much straight over to you. Jaya is faculty at... Isaac, <laughs> which is our UWC in Japan. She's pursuing a PhD and she's one of the people that I learn the most about from in education. So no pressure, Jaya, over to you. Jai, you're still on mute as well, so you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> unmute, share. So I've been on Zoom all day, but... Uh... Great. Perfect. Can every, everybody hear me? Yeah, great. Uh, so the question to explore today is what do learning institutions need to transform to meet the needs of the 21st century? I think when we talk about learning, it first comes down to our beliefs around learning. So do we believe that the learner is passive and only responds to stimuli? Do we believe that the learner values autonomy and learns to fulfill their needs? Uh, do we believe that the learner learns best through interactions? Uh, do we believe that the learner only builds on their personal experience? Or with the latest theories, do we believe that the learner is self-directed and connecting nodes between formal spaces and informal spaces? Our belief around learning essentially involve, invokes our practices that we match to it. From the 20th century to the 21st century, we've seen some pretty interesting shifts from education for work and profit to learning to meet both individual as well as collective needs and right now our planetary needs. From top down, somebody decides we all follow, irrespective of a connection, a real connection, to shared agency where we are co-creating the what we need to learn. The learner experience is going from a more directed experience, uh, I'm the teacher, I'm going to tell you what to do, to a more facilitated experience where we're asking more questions and trying to find out what does the learner want to know. Um, there's less and less emphasis on tests and exams and grades, although not really, and more emphasis on portfolios and experience and recommendations, although right now our students are kind of stuck in a cross between the two worlds. I really like 
this uh, list from the OECD. It's from a report called Trends Shaping Education on what really are the needs of our time. Um, they kind of missed out pandemics, but I think it's overall covered in security and um, pretty scary, right? Gig economy, sovereignty, re referendums, digital fraud. We want the next generation to be able to cope with all of this, um, to have a broad range of knowledge from finance to law and justice and a broad range of skills from critical thinking, compassion, communication, leadership, environmental stewardship. We want them to have a growth mindset. We want them to be able to deal with complexity. Lucky for us, um, I've been investigating um, a lot of different amazing institutions and it seems like all the solutions are out there to meet these needs from schools that are focusing on self-directed learning to project-based learning models to expeditionary learning models, schools that are training their teachers to move into more of a shape-shifter role with coaching skills, advisory skills, focus on informal interaction, uh, schools designing processes for students to have more agency, more choice, schools changing leadership structures, from the hierarchical structures to distributed structures and schools just saying okay I'm okay with no grades I'm okay with focusing on more authentic products more authentic processes so in um, today's breakout group we're just going to unpack this a little bit what do learning institutions need to transform the solutions are out there what's stopping us So only a few small questions to answer <laughs> in 20 minutes and we'll solve it. But awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Jaya. Um, so the next person and we're going to jump straight in is Chelsea from the Christensen Institute. I'm really happy to have her on. I read the Christensen Institute newsletters all the time and so it's fabulous to be uh, introduced to someone who actually works there. So Chelsea is the research fellow at the Christensen Institute. And Chelsea, I'm going to hand it over to you to talk about the learning community. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. It's great to see everybody here. Um, I'm just going to talk today about two areas of our research. One is more mature, one is more emerging, but both of them have everything to do with the learning community. And the first thing we usually think of with the, with, when we think of the learning community is we think about relationships. And I think everyone probably agrees that relationships matter. So if you have your video on, can you raise your hand if you ha can think of a story in your own lives where you received a new opportunity from an, an important relationship in your life? I'll try to see everybody's, everybody's hands. It's a common experience to, to get a new opportunity through a relationship that we have. Um, but when we think about our education system, mostly they see relationships as an input that helps drive learning outcomes. So a supportive teacher will be more likely to help a student succeed in their learning. But this ignores the fact that, that relationships have value in themselves for driving opportunity for students. And so rather than just talking about relationships, we talk about social capital, which describes the fact that relationships themselves offer that real value. They unlock access to support, to information, and even as we all just, um, acknowledge to opportunities and often to jobs. So in fact, an estimated 50% half of jobs come through personal connections. So schools can focus a whole lot on skills and content, but are we arming students with the networks that they also need to succeed and access pathways to opportunity? So uh, this is the focus of one of our areas of research on social capital. And our, our research so far really demonstrates that um, our education systems need to conceive of of relationships as outcomes of the learning experience and not just inputs. And moreover, outcomes that are worth measuring. And that's a lot of what we're talking about today is what, what should we be measuring? What boxes should we be ticking? So from what we see in our research, measurement strategies for social capital are in really early stages. But when we have studied the programs and schools that we have studied are generally looking to measure so social capital along three dimensions. And I'll, I'll just briefly give an overview of those three dimensions. One is quantity. 
So the simple metric of how many connections students forge through the course of their learning experience. The second metric is quality. So that would be measures like engagement in a relationship or the time spent together with the person who you're in relationship with or more ambitious measures like gauging trust or helping behaviors between people in relationships, so between students and a mentor, for example. And then the last element that, um, the last dimension that we're seeing people measure is, um, is about structure and diversity of a student's network. So how many people, the basic metric is how many people in your network know each other. So it's not just about your connections to someone else, but about their connections to each other. And so if, if everybody in your network knows each other, that means there's relatively low diversity in your network, which means that you may not have as much access to new information or new opportunities. So just like people talk about diversifying their staff portfolios, given the instability and unknowns in financial markets, we're also looking at the ways that schools and programs are seeking to diversify students' networks so they have more diverse access to information and opportunities. So we, as I mentioned, these, these measurement strategies are, re, are in really early stages, but we are, our research is actively seeking to deepen those measurement strategies, share how different schools and programs are measuring, and get the word out um, to, to, so that schools and programs can begin seeing relationships as outcomes. Um, we'll have a measurement brief coming out this summer, which I'm looking forward to sharing. And the last thing I'll say is more of a provocation because it's about some early emerging research from our organization that I'm leading. And that's that traditional education systems conceive of students as the product. So students go through a process and they come out the other end as more valuable citizens and workers. But as we know, schools are being asked to do more and more in our, in our new century, in the 21st century. And so we're beginning to study how schools and programs conceive of students, not as just products, but as producers who contribute value into the education system and not just take value away from it. So we have, we're documenting some early examples of this, but I'm looking forward to learning more from folks. And if you have um, examples or you'd like to talk more about it, I'd love to be connected. So those are the two things I'm talking about today. And in our breakout room, we're gonna be discussing what in your experience or your opinion are the characteristics and indicators of a high quality learning community and who contributes to that community and how. Perfect, thank you so much, Chelsea. Really appreciate that. And uh, leaping straight to Sean, who's the Director of Innovation and Learning or Learning Innovation at um, UWC Atlantic. Um, Sean was also the director of, uh, you will tell me, whichever school it was in Liverpool, um, uh, the studio, the studio. <laughs> uh, which did some really innovative work and, and both are Ashoka Change Maker schools. So Sean, over to you to talk about the purpose of learning. Can everyone see my screen there? No, you need to share screen again, I think, Sean. Okay, sorry. Perfect. Okay. So my provocation um, in terms of what we need to transform in the education system, it's actually going to focus on school evaluation. Um, because as we evaluate learning, we need to think about how we support schools um, who are trying to forge new ways of learning to um, evaluate themselves and how we can build a community of practice around that. And that seems to be a really important question to ask at the moment because there's such a mismatch between um, the learning that we want student schools to do and um, the way in which our evaluation system support them to do that. You know, as we've heard, you know, the needs of our time demand education that unites personal goals and social progress. That gives us our sense of purpose. Um, but how do we measure it? You know, what would we notice in schools um, that are doing this really well? You know, what's being learned? How is it being learned? And um, as Chelsea was saying, you know, what are the, what's the character of the relationships that's driving that kind of learning? And I'd like to strike a note of caution, really. Um, you know, by seeking to capture this, are we in danger of watching it dissipate as we alter the relationships that, that are creating it? So as Rebecca said, you know, I, I was a school leader in the UK and I've been through my fair share of Ofsted inspections. And I also I've always felt that 
I was riding two horses simultaneously, you know, trying to educate for purpose and the common good, whilst uh, knowing that our efforts were being judged by a very different data-driven sort of yardstick. So it's a, it's a joy, I must say, to be at United World College and be back here at Atlantic College, and where we do feel we've got the autonomy uh, to focus on what's important to us. So it forces us to think about what an ideal school evaluation system and process might look like. So let's imagine for a moment you know, a world where the evaluation that we use is able to capture the learning that it, it, where it is rather than where it's taught. It's able to galvanise the school community around its wider purpose and able to do so in a way that isn't just developmental in forming school improvement, but it's also generative in terms of involvement and inclusion in that community. So school evaluation that's based on the kind of principles of user design, I guess, you know, one that's really appreciative, one that's participatory, and one, one that deepens, um, deepens connection. You know, to make, this, uh, to make this really work, I think we need a different conceptual map um, to, frame, uh, to frame this um, new educational model. And there's one that's really based on the context of the school. Um, this process invites transformation and constant renewal. It's dynamic, it's not static, it's circular rather than linear. Um, and so purposeful school evaluation, it listens, it engages, it discovers, it adapts, and it secures improvement by, by building capacity. So if we look for a moment um, at how school evaluation has evolved over the last couple of decades, you know, it's gone from a model of school effectiveness that measured everything that moved in order to hold people accountable, um, to a model of school improvement where everything that was thought to cause a change was measured, and that was replicated, assuming that that would lead to school improvement. But a new model really needs to focus on the needs of students first and put those in the centre of, um, of this system rather than the, the system itself or the organisation. So it's a user-led model in that sense. And secondly, we might ask, you know, how well integrated is the school in its community? You know, and how well is that reflected in the learning that students do? Are there real world learning outcomes for students that are based on real world projects, for example, as happens in many schools? Thirdly, we might look beyond internal data-driven metric towards participatory ways of capturing narrative and things that cat narratives that catalogue the ways in which the school is mediating the impact of social change and allowing that to shape the learning that's, that's happening. So it might be really good to focus on students' learning journeys and celebrate what these learning journeys are preparing students to become in the world through portfolios, through mastery transcripts. And of course, it might be really good for this evaluation process or system to focus on schools' responsiveness to what's emerging and how it models as a community um, adaptability and dealing with, with complex change. So it raises, it, this raises a series of questions um, about how um, this school evaluation might happen and a question that, that it might ask, schools might ask of itself. You know, how globally competent are our learners? You know, what kind of contributions um, do we make to, to sustainability? How well do learners apply knowledge to real world situations? What's reported from internship or work-based learning? How do real world entrepreneurial projects um, tell us um, about in, um, entrepreneurial skills development? How involved are learners in campaigns and civic involvement? And what kind of effects do these relationships that drive learning have in the long term on, on, on students? How does mental health um, and what, how do we evidence that in terms of maybe clinical outcomes or surveys? How strong is learner agency among students and teachers? How physically fit are we and how can we apply what we know about health to our, to our individual and community wellbeing? So to go into the breakout room, um, I'd like to ask the question, what would we notice um, in schools that are educating for purpose or the common good? And there's a, there's a key driving question behind this, which is around the roles um, that each of these dimensions might play in creating the conditions we, within which we authentically live in a school community as models of, of, of um, purpose and living for the common good. So there's lots to do there. <laughs> um, and um, if we get onto it, let's hope, uh, we'll be able to come up with a checklist um, of not only what things are the most important, um, but also how we might evidence them and maybe even have a discussion about whether it's a good idea to evidence them and how we can do that in a sensitive way that, uh, that um, drives the purpose in the school. 
Great stuff. Thank you so much, Sean. Now, I know <laughs> listening to all three of those, I'm like, oh, my goodness, there's about a three day workshop on every single yeah, topic on that. And yet we're going to have <laughs> a 20 minute discussion. So what we hope will happen now, and this is the technical bit, um, is that magically um, there's the WISE team, who are the technical whizzes behind this, are going to press a button and magically all of us, of which I think there's about 55, 56 participants, are going to get be put into one of six breakout rooms. We have a facilitator for each breakout room where we can dig into one of these topics. Um, so um, I think it's probably best that we just go straight for it <laughs> in order to have mass, uh, the most amount of participation time. So wise team, can you do your magic to get us into breakout rooms? You have done so. So we'll see you all in a little bit when we come back for the plenary. So um, I'm going to call sort of uh, our facilitators to feedback. And Jaya, you were speaking then, so I'm going to call on you first, um, just to give um, a little bit of um, an overview of just yeah. Uh, mm. what okay. So yeah, like I said, we just kind of got started, warmed up. Uh, we discussed a little bit about uh, the first prompt was uh, the needs of the government, needs of boards of education, uh, needs of boards of the school, needs of parents. Um, and those needs basically go from um, we want to show impact or we want to do mass measurement, do we need, we have financial needs. And uh, somewhere from Spain was, uh, we also care about 21st century skills being built, but none of those needs really match education for good. Mm, we also asked, okay, then what other road, what, what other, other, what else are the roadblocks that stops us from transforming uh, despite the system, right? Um, there too, um, mindsets of parents, um, this uh, um, innovation in assessment systems uh, stops us from transforming, and that's when we got cut off. Okay, yeah, just at the juicy bit of uh, the assessment piece, which is always the sticking point. <laughs> okay, I'm going to head very quickly over to Graham. Graham's the director of Fairgreen uh, International School in the Sustainable City. Um, and so, Graham, thank you for facilitating the other breakout room on the how of learning. No problem. Well, like all good um, school leaders, I'm going to delegate. Um, back to Debbie. Debbie was doing a brilliant job participating and recording. So. Um, Debbie, can you unmute, unmute, unmute yourself, please? Thank you. Sure. Um, Graham did an amazing job making us think of a lot of things in a short amount of time. But um, three things to point out. One is we have been so much better at listening to our communities because now we're talking to our parents and the administrators, but our students directly because of online learning, those of us that have been pushed there. And we've been able to jump this curve as educators, hoping that come fall when we go back into the classroom, that will be better um, in understanding our students' needs because of COVID-19. And what Graham said is, we, you know, we took it two days to prepare for the class, but we're like building a plane um, while we're flying the plane at the same time, and we're not necessarily doing great at it. The other thing that we wanted to point out was the Ken Robinson School uh, video that most people have won. It's the number one TED talk, talk, and it talks about how schools kill creativity. Well, schools are killing our students into becoming memorization teams, teams and the way we've taught has been the same for 20 years for, for 200 years and we have to break that system and so the last thing is from the challenges is that we are not helping our students in the long term by feeding what the administrators want us to have which is those scores and those numbers we're not meeting their needs because they are not prepared especially in low-income communities and the inequity in the school and the access. But we, what we do want to bring out is at the end of the day, when this is all over and settled, we wonder if we are in such a better position as educators to prepare our students for purpose and for a difference, and that we're going to be able to change this educational system that's been broken for a long time because of this major crisis. Wow. 
yes <laughs> to all of those things thank you so much um, just a note to everyone um in the chat room um we've asked people to just have a if you could contribute um your biggest takeaway from the session and next steps and i'm i'm also going to add a question there of of we need more conversations about this and clearly there's an incredible group um, on, on this group. So whether anyone wants to sort of be connected or whether we need follow up from, from some of these, because this is just feeling like we're putting our toe in the water. Um, Chelsea, handing over to you. Great, I was not as successful as Graham at, at um, delegating, but I'm happy to share a couple thoughts from our group conversation. We had a good conversation among six of us. Um, the first thing we talked about was the need in for a positive and high quality learning community, the need to have shared purpose. And we had some helpful discussion among the group about the need for shared institutional purpose, such as a school mission or a, the mission of the learning community, but also the need for that shared purpose to create space for students to have individual purpose, the differences in their individual purpose and student autonomy within that. Um, we talked about the need for learning communities to create safety for students to make mistakes and for them to receive genuine feedback about their work and their learning. Um, and then the last thing, just before we got cut off, we were beginning to hear a comment from one of our participants about the, the importance of mutual learning or multi-directional learning, not just that students are learning from teachers, but that teachers are also learning from students and that there's a spirit of learning across the entire community. Yeah, I like it, sort of multi-way learning, and we're all in it together. Perfect. Um, yeah. Very quickly handing over to Audrey, um, yes. who's also talking about the learning community. <laughs> yes, so uh, for our group, um, what Chelsea had shared uh, previously resonated a lot, the, uh, the quality, the quantity, and the diversity of relationship, and that was uh, um, the group agreed that it was something to maybe spend more time at, at looking at and at evaluating the impact. And on that, one of our participants shared um, the experience and the importance also of uh, alumni networks uh, and the quality and the involvement of alumni and how it also can deepen the relationship created. And um, another participant shared also the importance of the involvement of parents in learning communities and how uh, it is important to develop programs who, uh, which are targeting uh, the involvement of parents. And last but not least, uh, another um, a participant uh, spoke about a program that they've implemented in South Africa where um, they were uh, placing uh, vulnerable children in, um, in companies. And they, uh, it, the outcome was that uh, there was at the end a very good uh, rate of employment, but also uh, most of them uh, decided to continue their studies. And also there were some personal uh, development. So that's a way also something that uh, needs to be evaluated. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Sean, um, into um, our metrics and evaluation piece. I'm on mute now. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we were looking at, um, you know, what we'd notice in schools that were educated for purpose and how we might um, create metrics around that. Um, I think the first point that was mentioned was around student agency and how important that is as a driver um, of learning and, and what students need um, at the moment in particular. And, um, and we got into a brief discussion about how that might be, how we might recognise that, um, maybe by looking at the breadth and the quality of questioning in the school, maybe through all levels at the school, not just in class, but also the questions that, that um, are shaping the culture um, of the school. I think that speaks to Chelsea's um, groups uh, point as well doesn't it around um, how um, purpose is driven by a, a strong sense of where you're going as a school community and that's that's obviously a function of the questions that are being asked there and we had an interesting discussion about um, about the relationship between the community and the learning that happens within the school and we raise a kind of dichotomy sometimes between international schools that can sometimes feel feel divorced from their communities and um, and national state schools which have got a much better chance of of integrating with their communities and being kind of community development projects in some cases um, and we thought about ways in which we could maybe bridge that by um, through the curriculum and international schools having or having ways of of um, locating international um, issues and learnings but from 
um, a, a, in a very local context and the evidence of that would be abound in, the, in, in what the students are learning in terms of the curriculum. Then we spoke about authenticity and purpose and, um, and the need for, um, for purpose to be expressed um, in the school, not just in terms of um, what it espouses, but also in the way in which it's run. So, so the culture of purpose and how the school lives as a community and models um, living for the common good. And that should be evident um, in observations in the school. And you could feed that into a, a school evaluation as well. And then we talked about the school evaluation process and how, um, as I started with, you know, there's sometimes a mismatch between the narrow focuses of evaluation and what we feel we need to, in order to, to, to propel a sense of purpose in what we do. Perfect, thank you so much, Sean. And last but not least, Tana. Hi, everyone. Um, we had a really fruitful discussion and one of the things that really stood out from our discussion was uh, something that Wayne from what Nesta said when he said that we're using 20th century uh, measurement uh, metrics to measure 21st century uh, like learnings that we're trying to measure. So we need to reevaluate how we're measuring before we even discuss what we need to be measuring and how we do it, um, which, we, which was a really useful thing. And one of the things that we also discussed was how to continuously measure rather than measure at the end of two years or one year through the typical exam structures that we have and making sure that teachers have the capacity to measure for things like such as SEL and we discussed really interesting topics of whether or not students should be trained um, on data and integrating how to gather data and um, understand it and problem solving and unfortunately the timing was a little short to keep expanding on some of the points that we wanted to discuss but it was a really fruitful discussion um, that we found very interesting points of one of the most important which of which was re-evaluating the how, not just the what we're measuring. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, fruitful discussions. I'm going to hand over to Amina for some of the last uh, words, but I do think it's uh, like these conversations and, and those of us who are sort of understand it and believe in it, but also passing it to the students as well and then have uh, that purpose also be driven by the students so given student agency um i think you know we all uh, some of the highlights was as well schools should foster creativity uh, and and not kill it and uh, this is something that we all believe in and that takes us again to the conversation around okay how do we do that and uh Tana and your group what you guys mentioned around how we need to uh, revisit uh, our evaluation systems um, is, is really important. Um, and there is also another conversation that taps on the gr uh, grit mindset and the, um, the growth mindset is that how we can use uh, challenges uh, to learn. And this is one of the, uh, you know, the pieces that I've seen here uh, on the chat. So great conversation. Uh, we talked about uh, at least um, one of uh, the other points that I wanted to bring uh, is that uh, to, to capture all of that, we need to look at assessment differently. We need to change mindsets of the different stakeholders involved and expectations as well. And then we need to continue this conversation in a sense to uh, help, you know, foster collaborations on this topic beyond today's session. Uh, and that's what I would uh, invite you all to do. Uh, I hope uh, today's session has created also the ability for you to start uh, new networks and new connections uh, with different people that we have here on today's session. I'd encourage you to continue those conversations. What we're gonna do, at least um, us and, and UWC, we're hoping that uh, we'll use maybe some of those uh, discussions and points that we've had today to see if we can put something productive uh, that we can share uh, back uh, with all of you or in the format of an op-ed, uh, so stay tuned. Um, and uh, before we close, I would like to also 
uh, thank everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, our partner, UWC School, for allowing us this opportunity. Uh, our speakers uh, and moderators, Jaya, Chelsea, Sean, Graham, Fana, and Audrey. Uh, and most of all, you, uh, our network uh, and our learning community. Thank you for being there. Uh, and um, let's continue this conversation and um, let's drive innovation forward. So thanks for being there. Thank you so much. Um, really lovely closing words. Just to let you know that there is a feedback form as ever, <laughs> but that also means that hopefully we can continue to stay in touch. Um, and I do know that there were thoughts wanting to be shared and slides wanting to be shared. So we'll figure out how we can do that uh, to everyone. But uh, um, it was wonderful for everyone to participate from all over. And um, yeah, let's keep networking to keep on education reform. <laughs> <laughs>